Hello and welcome to the very first Weird Wild World, a weekly series that takes a look at the power of nature. From natural disasters to rare and strange phenomena, we will take a look at the wonder and weirdness of our planet. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to start off the series by discussing New Zealand's White Island eruption. What can I say? I'm a sucker for volcanoes. Today, we're not only going to talk about this fatal eruption, but the history of the volcano itself, as well as the tourism surrounding it. But before we dive right into this though, let me put a content warning right up front. This is not some super exciting passive look at how volcanoes form and explode. There is a very sad story associated with what happened at White Island, and this is going to be quite serious. We're starting out this series a little bit more graphic than other ones personally, but I would say that this story absolutely stuck out with me and I had to dig into the past to lead up to what happened. So if you're not in the mood for this topic, I completely understand it will be an emotional video. After looking at all the survivor footage and interviews, it definitely had me very shaken. But with that being said, let's get into it. Wakari or White Island is an active volcano about 30 miles from the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand, located in the Bay of Plenty. It was sighted and named by Captain James Cook in 1796, but there's an interesting little legend about how the island was actually formed in Maori folklore as well. According to one source, a great Tohunga spiritual leader decided to travel inland to explore the area. While he and his travel companions had a rest on the eastern side of Lake Taupo, he spotted a very beautiful mountain to the south. He decided he wanted to climb that mountain for a better view of the region. So it happened that he and his slave Arujo started their dangerous journey. The higher they climbed, the colder it got, and the cold froze their breath and made their fingers and feet stiff. He prayed to his sisters in Hawaii to send him fire to warm him. His sisters heard him praying and instantly sent the fire demons Te Pupu and Te Hoata to their brother who was fighting with death. The two demons swam as fast as possible through the Pacific to Wakari, White Island. When they lifted their heads, the earth around them became a fiery pit. And this is what you can still find today on White Island. And although I will absolutely butcher every single name, I love listening to different folklore from different countries and hearing how they explain things before they understood and just the history and the way that they were able to weave logic around what was going on. I just, oh my God, I love it. It's so, so cool. However, how White Island scientifically works is a little bit of a different story. It's estimated to be 150 to 200,000 years old and it's New Zealand's most active volcano. According to my sources, it's a stratovolcano, a composite core volcano made of layers of andesite, a type of volcanic rock, and lava flows and pyroclastic deposits. Since human settlement in New Zealand, there has been continual low-level activity and small eruptions. Quite a lot of this activity in the 1900s is documented, though there may not be a ton of information on each specific event. Apparently, a crater formed in April 1933 and one that formed in 1947 was named Noisy Nelly. In 1962, a crater formed that was called Big John, and in 1966, another named Gulliver. And I'm kind of loving these names, honestly. However, there was a tragedy in the early 1900s involving White Island. According to a source, attempts were first made to mine sulfur on Wakari White Island around the beginning of the 20th century. Some sources say these attempts first began in 1885, but regardless, mining attempts were made. Sulfur was used in the manufacture of sulfuric acid and superphosphate fertilizer. On the 10th of September, 1914, 10 miners were killed when part of the crater wall collapsed, causing a landslide. The only survivor was the mining company's cat, Peter the Great. White Island is New Zealand's most active volcano, known to Maori as Waikari, which means to uplift or expose to view. Sulfur mining on Waikari White Island recommenced in the late 1920s, but proved uneconomic and ceased during the early 1930s. A total of 11,000 tons had been obtained. So yeah, mining on an active volcano, 
I don't really envy anyone that had that job. But despite this, in 1953, White Island was declared a private scenic reserve and became a tourist destination. It's said that even 18,000 people would visit the island each year in its peak, and they'd walk around a path among the craters led by tour guides. But if there's anything I know about volcanoes, it's really simple, don't mess with them. Although there was a fair amount of activity going on at this time, White Island didn't really start to pick up in activity until around 1975. From 1975 until 2001, there were frequent small eruptions making this island's most active period in 100 years. Ash and gas plumes rose as high as 10 kilometers, lava bombs and blocks were thrown into the sea, and occasionally the glow of red hot rock was visible at night from the Bay of Plenty Coast. A new eruptive episode started in 2012. This produced ash explosions until August 2012, followed by a growth of a lava dome from September through December. Sulfur and steam eruptions followed in February through April 2013. Larger explosive eruptions occurred in August and October 2013. In April 2016, a moderate eruption impacting the whole of the main crater floor occurred and was followed by ash emissions in September. The eruption in April actually excavated the floor of the 1978 to 1990 crater complex by 13 meters and a new lake formed a couple years later in 2018. So needless to say, White Island hasn't been quiet for quite some time. One woman, Chiara Tognari in 2011, said that guides on a White Island tourist trip failed her when her foot plunged through the earth into boiling mud. Tognari said that the tour group didn't carry first aid kits, there were no burn dressings on the boat, and the company allowed tours to continue while she waited for medical care. She stated, as I walked across, my foot literally just plunged through the surface and into this bubbling hot mud. If you imagine putting your finger through the top of a crust of a pie, that's basically what it was like for my foot. I heard everyone gasping behind me. The tour guides did not have a first aid kit, but poured water from a drink bottle on her leg. Tognieri hobbled back to the wharf as the rest of the group continued their tour. She was met by a company manager who offered a bucket of seawater for her leg, but did not have burn dressings, she said. I was in a lot of pain. I couldn't take my foot out of the water. It was stinging too badly. Tognieri waited on the wharf for 90 minutes while the tour continued. When she arrived back on dry land in Wakatane, little help was forthcoming, she said. A company bus driver offered to take her back to Rotorura, but only after she had dropped everyone off. It was five hours before she received treatment for the burn at a hospital. She spent the remainder of her time in New Zealand hobbling to medical appointments every couple days and her leg became infected. Tognieri cut her trip short and flew back to the United Kingdom. Peter and Jenny Tate, the couple who owned the company at the time, didn't respond. White Island Tours was bought for $9 million from them by Nagati Awa back in 2017, though more on them in just a bit. However, it was 2019 when an even more massive tragedy struck and an eruption took place on the island while tourists were present. But before we get into the serious events that happened in December, 2019, let's just take a moment to speak about today's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by me. Well. More specifically, it's sponsored by my merch shop, multilevelmerch.shop. And that is the place to find everything you need to support the show. We've got hoodies, sweatshirts, my personal favorite, mugs, and even phone cases in so many amazing designs. Maybe you want your own Yikes on Trikes designs or join the Carb Crusaders. Either way, make sure you stay a good noodle and there's designs for that too. Multilevelmerch.shop. And when you check out, use code WWW for the first episode of Weird Wild World to receive 10 10% off your order. We ship internationally, so make sure to check it out. The sale ends at the end of April, by the way, so make sure you stop by and grab some merch while the sale's going on. Love you guys, let's get back to the episode. The fatal eruption occurred in the vents from the 1978-1990 crater complex at 2.11 p.m. on Monday, December 9th, 2019. Seconds before the eruption, disturbing images show tourists walking inside craters of the volcano, unaware of the danger they were in. Images reportedly caught by Geonet, an agency that observes White Island with webcams, seismometers, and UV spectrometers, caught some of these tourists in some of their last moments. But how did they miss this? If the volcano was going to erupt, wouldn't they see some kind of unusual activity or sign? Well, it turns out that they did. 
Three months before the eruption in September, Geonet reported small geyser-like explosions of mud and steam happening inside the crater. Since the crater lake level had risen, covering some active vents with water, this was easily explained and no cause for concern. Volcanologist Steve Sherburn is quoted as saying, they do not pose any hazard to visitors to the island and are not a sign of increasing volcanic activity at that time. However, a month later in October, things began to change. According to one source, while the volcanic alert level remained at one out of five, Geonet reported an increase in activity and a level of uncertainty about what this means. There had been a notable change in the volcano's sulfur dioxide output and its level of volcanic tremors. With both factors at their highest mark since 2016, when White Island last erupted, sulfur dioxide is produced by magma beneath the surface of the earth. Its increase suggested more gas was passing through the volcano from these depths, but these sorts of fluctuations are common in volcanoes and could conceivably be caused by all sorts of things. The agency said there was slight uncertainty about the exact meaning of its data. While the pattern of signals shows similarities with the 2011 to 2016 period and could suggest that White Island may be entering a period where eruptive activity is more likely than normal, recent observations can also be explained by the increased gas flux, said Geonet volcanologist Yannick Baer. Personally, I believe that this is when the tours should have stopped. I'm obviously not a volcanologist, but shouldn't it be common sense to know that increased activity and uncertainty means, hey, something bad could happen, so maybe we shouldn't send people to a volcanic island? This was a minor eruption as far as volcanoes go, but in terms of safety, even a minor volcanic event can be deadly. And yet so many warning signs seem to be completely ignored. In mid-November that year, Geonet raised the volcanic alert level of the island, and volcanologists warned that eruptions of steam, gas, mud, or rocks could occur with little to no warning. Again, remember, this doesn't just mean, oh, some puddles would form. We're speaking on a volcanic level here, a massive scale. A week later, a magnitude 5.9 earthquake shook the Bay of Plenty, where White Island is located. The earthquake's epicenter was about 50 kilometers off the coast of New Zealand and 115 kilometers deep. It caused no change in White Island's activity, but authorities warned moderate volcanic unrest was continuing. Then December 3rd, Geonet reported substantial gas steam and mud bursts. Volcanologist Brad Scott said, this fountaining is regularly throwing mud and debris 20 to 30 meters into the air. On the day of the fated eruption, December 9th, it's estimated that 47 people, up to 38 of them from the Royal Caribbean cruise ship Ovation of the Seas, were on or around White Island at the time. Webcam images say that about a dozen were, tragically, inside the crater itself when the eruption happened. In the minutes following, White Island tour operators rescued as many as they could, and 23 people managed to get off the island. The majority had suffered various degrees of burns. Official rescue operations were launched immediately. St. John Ambulance dispatched seven helicopters to help, Wakatane Hospital had turned into an emergency operation center, and New Zealand police advised people to avoid a large area along the coast. But they were hampered by the treacherous conditions, which prevented them from setting foot on the island itself and made it difficult to determine how many victims were stranded. Some of these people had been transported to shore. However, there is still a number remaining on the island who are currently unaccounted for. Police Deputy Commissioner John Tim said as the afternoon unfolded. At this stage, it is too dangerous for police and rescue services to go to the island. The island is currently covered in ash and volcanic material. We are taking expert advice with regards to the safety of any rescue attempt. Prime Minister Scott Morrison confirmed a number of Australians had been caught up in the disaster. A terrible tragedy is unfolding, Mr. Morrison said. Australians have been caught up in this terrible event and we are working to determine their well-being. As afternoon turned into evening and rescuers were still unable to access White Island, the official death toll rose to five. The physical environment is unsafe for us to return, said Mr. Timms. He said at least a double digit number of people remained on the island, but emergency services would not be in a position to reach it until at least the next day. Tragically, on December 10th, it was announced that aerial reconnaissance found no signs of life at any point on the island. Mr. Morrison confirmed 24 Australians had been visiting the island and 11 were still missing at that point with 13 others hospitalized. 
Police took DNA from the mortal remains to confirm who had passed away. Of the 47 people on the island, there were 25 females, 22 males from ages 14 to 72 years old. There were five New Zealanders, 24 Australians, four Germans, nine Americans, two Chinese, two from the UK, and one Malaysian Australian. The official death count was 22, although some sources say 21, and only later was it revealed that an emergency management plan dealing with a potential eruption at White Island had never actually been finalized. So what went incredibly wrong? Why was anyone touring there to begin with if no evacuation plan for this active volcano was even made? I wanted to find out what happened, so I started with this documentary, Trapped in the Volcano, and I searched for answers and for a solid timeline of events. And here's what I found. As we mentioned, the Royal Caribbean Cruise Ship Company owns a ship known as Ovation of the Seas. There was a day trip to White Island on the cruise, and in the brochure, the passengers were simply told to wear enclosed shoes. The brochure also read, get close to the drama. Gas masks will help you get near roaring steam vents, bubbling pits of mud, hot volcanic streams, and the amazing lake of steaming acid. The most warning they had was that this was a strenuous walk, but there was no mention of an eruption whatsoever. The White Island tours would be guiding them that day. This documentary also stresses that this volcano is a typical cone volcano, what a kid would draw in school, they call it. The only difference is that this volcano is mostly underwater, so only the tip is poking out. Although White Island may look different and may be called an island, tourists are literally walking around the rim of an active volcano. If they had known this or any of the risks associated with White Island at that time, I wonder how many would have still chosen to visit it. Perfect. The volcano warned them, volcanologists warned them, activity was picking up, for an unpredictable activity like a volcanic eruption, this one was giving all the signs and symptoms that something was happening, and yet they didn't listen. There was even proof that the pathways tourists typically walked were littered with deposits from the 2016 eruption, a clear sign that White Island was not safe for tourists in the event of an eruption. And yet, as we know, many tourists were on those pathways in 2019. I do think that tourists should consider risks when they travel, but in this case, how could they? They really weren't given any idea of the risk associated with it, and it was billed to them as a perfectly safe activity. I don't think it's that much of a stretch to assume that your tour guide or the cruise ship you're on wouldn't advertise and encourage a walk in wrong. The photos and videos of White Island, it is absolutely gorgeous, and I can understand why people would be excited to visit. Hell, I would be excited to visit, but Seeing footage of Crater Lake with the people standing there only minutes before it erupted, it's eerie, it's upsetting, and it's not so beautiful anymore, knowing what was to come only moments later. The eruption itself was a steam eruption that only lasted a minute or two, but because it was so unexpected and created debris flying through the air at speeds up to 100 meters per second, there would have been no warning and no means to provide safety for anyone on that island that day. Footage of the boat that had just left the island minutes previously is absolutely chaotic and disturbing as well, seeing these people that were helpless, watching as people in another group behind them were trapped and buried on that island. The once beautiful, acidic, bright colors of the island were gone, completely covered in a gray ash. A few people were swimming out to inflatable rescue boats. Many of survivors had ash in their mouths. And one woman described the skin as dripping off people like wax. The oldest of the group, John, 72 years old, was turning purple and felt cold from how intense his burns were and his skin loss. He did survive, but his son, Chris, did not. A rescue mission was launched, but even on the helicopter ride, one of the survivors passed away. One of the helicopter pilots, Tim Story, describes simply finding body after body. Seeing several people pass away, including tour guides that had tried to give people first aid. Another article describes Story's rescue mission and reads, At first, when Story came across two young women, Crystal Browett and either Jessica Richards or Zoe Hosking, lying unconscious next to each other, he thought they were dead, but feeling a pulse, he found one on both. A few yards downhill, lying next to a stream, Tippany Mangi was showing no signs of life. 
50 yards away, one of the Hollander boys was breathing. Looking for Hayden, Law followed a set of footprints in the ash leading away from the main group, past Mangi, towards the sea. His friend was 40 yards on, lying by the same stream, unresponsive. Winona Langford was nearby. She also wasn't moving. As the three pilots worked, they were able to piece together some of what happened. From where they were, the walkers would have seen the initial eruption. Behind a boulder, Story and Law came across a small pile of phones and tablets. Video from them would later confirm that several had stopped to film the steam cloud. What none of them could have seen until it crested the lip and consumed them was the horizontal blast of rock, ash, and acid mist. Many injuries were to their anterior sides, suggesting that they were facing it when it hit. Superintendent Andy McGregor, police district commander of the Bay of Plenty said, in the ash was hydrochloride, hydrofluoride, and sulfur dioxide. Mix those with water and you get hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, which attacks calcium and sulfuric acid. So you've got superheated gases, you've got the blast, and you've got the acid atmosphere. Imagine what that does. The pilots didn't have to. Along with the burns, they found evidence of the eruption's force. Law noted numerous shrapnel injuries and signs of internal damage. Story came across one man with part of his head missing. Amid the carnage were signs of courage and sacrifice. A guide's medical kit sitting among the group was probably carried there by Hayden or Mangi after the blast. Many of the injured were wearing gas masks that looked to have been placed on them after they'd lost consciousness. In Mangi's outstretched hand was an asthma inhaler as though he were passing it to someone when he succumbed. The footprints described almost unbelievable heroism. Atop the ash, they had to have made after the eruption and seemed to indicate that Hayden had backtracked and tried to lead his group away from the crater towards the ocean. The position of his body, Mangi's, and Winona's suggested that in the darkness of the ash cloud, they were following the stream downhill. None of them made it, but Winona's elder brother, Jesse, had run all the way down to the jetty. As they processed what they were seeing, the pilots steeled themselves with the thought that they had arrived in time. Most of the injured were hanging on, if barely. The pilots understood that rescue crews were en route. I think they were only about four or five miles away, Story said. Then sometime between 325 and 330, Funnel came back on the radio. The rescuers had been ordered to Wakatane. No help was coming. The pilots were on their own. It's also said Story later hassled police to find out who survived. And personally, I don't think hassle is really the right word here. He seemed to be asking because, you know, in all the chaos, he and the other pilots lost track of who was pulled off the island. Hassling here just kind of means more like he questioned them a bit, but it wasn't harassment or anything. But regardless of that, Story and the other pilots risked their lives to help these survivors without a doubt. Fears of another eruption delayed the rescue mission to bring eight bodies left on the island home. When a rescue team did arrive, only six remained. The bodies of Hayden Marshall Inman and Winona Langford had been washed away by heavy rain. In total, 19 of the 21 people that died were from Ovation of the Seas. It's also said that Hayden's body was eventually found lying on the seabed by Navy divers a few days later. However, his body fell off their boat in a heavy swell and sank hundreds of feet in the water. The search for Hayden and Winona was sadly called off on Christmas Eve. If you would like to read more or watch more of these personal stories, I do highly recommend that you take a look at that documentary. It is incredibly heavy and difficult to get through. And I'm warning you now, I cried at least twice. After the eruption, as one source states, hundreds of columnists and radio hosts would take a different view. How crazy do you have to be, they would ask, to go walking around a live volcano, let alone run a business taking people there? And the truth was not crazy at all. Compared with climbing or jet boating or even swimming or driving a car, visiting a volcano is relatively safe. A 2017 Journal of Applied Volcanology survey of every recorded volcano fatality for the past five centuries found that an average of one tourist, climber, camper, student, pilgrim, or park warden died every year on a volcano. Instead, like earthquakes and tsunamis, most volcano deaths occur among people who live in the area. The journal counted 800 million residents within six miles of the world's 1,508 active volcanoes. 
and reported that 216,035 had died within the past 517 years. Though today with early warnings and evacuation drills, years can pass without a single one of those either. That spotless record partly reflected the tameness of the tours. If New Zealand's adventure industry often seemed like a marriage of the outdoors and mad science, seeing what happens, say, if you leapt off a bridge with a rubber band tied to your ankles, a walk around White Island was one of its more gentler offerings. If White Island Tours was guilty of anything, it was of hamming up the risk. A leaflet from 2006 was headlined, Volcano, Handle with Scare. Guides like to warn visitors that an eruption could happen at any moment and that anybody caught in one could expect to be hit by rocks, scalded by steam, and enveloped in an acid mist as the crater lake flash vaporized. Alan Marshall Inman would have his groups dip their fingers into the coppery streams and ask them if they tasted blood. Hayden would tell the story of an ash eruption during a visit in September, 2017. We were walking into it, he told a travel program in July, 2018. I could definitely feel the nerves inside me for sure. That was the whole idea of visiting White Island. It was about the thrill of feeling a little more alive by feeling a little closer to death, all the while knowing that really, you were in no more danger than if you would be crossing a road. And White Island was considered relatively safe. When you compare it to other outdoor activities where people can be injured frequently, it was. I don't blame the tour guides for hamming up the volcano, simply trying to show the tourists there a good time. But I do blame the companies that should have, at bare minimum, been keeping an eye on the place and heeding the warning signs it was giving. However, those that own White Island are not some massive faceless corporation like you might think. Far from it, actually. The biggest Maori tribe, Nagati Awa, owned the island and bought it using money from the state program designed to compensate for the colonial theft of their land. They were using the White Island tours to fund social programs to lift their people, historically some of the poorest in New Zealand. I think in this case, it's possible to feel sympathetic for someone as well as disapprove of those actions. The people that owned White Island and used White Island tours were not an evil corporation. They were a Maori tribe, buying land back after it had been stolen and running White Island tours like a second family. At the same time, even if their intentions were pure, I also believe that the Nagati Awa should have seen the warning signs several months before and put the tour groups on hold. Elders in the tribe did prohibit visits and fishing trips to the island within hours of the disaster. They led a daily service of communion and remembrance at the Maori Meeting House or Marais next to White Island tours. And four days after the catastrophe, they sailed to the island at dawn with relatives to hold another service at sea. This was meaningful, especially for family members, I'm sure, but I still can't help but wish they had cut off the island from visitors sooner. This case, however, is not nearly as straightforward as you think it might be. There's a 1972 law that effectively bans personal injury lawsuits in New Zealand. Instead, the government set up a law where they agree to foot the bill for the dead and injured. However, after the deaths of 37 tourists between 2006 and 2009 and the deaths of 29 miners in a methane explosion in 2010 and an earthquake that killed 185 people in the largest city, new regulations needed to be imposed. The result in 2013 was a stringent new set of health and safety regulations policed by a new government agency, WorkSafe, with the power to impose million dollar fines and imprison offenders for up to five years. New Zealand's adventure operators were required to obtain WorkSafe certification and submit to regular inspections. White Island Tours wasn't affected really since it had a clean record. A WorkSafe inspector two months before the eruption raised absolutely no concerns. And yet the survivors required so many skin grafts that a global order was put in for 33.8 square meters, the equivalent of 16 bodies worth of skin. One 19 year old Jesse Langford had burns on over 90% of his body as he ran through the crater. On December 30th, he wrote a eulogy for his father, mother, and sister who passed away during the eruption. From his hospital bed, he watched a live stream of their funeral. The past weeks have taught me that when times are tough, you have to find the inner strength that pushes you to persevere. You always have a bit more in you, he wrote. 
Some of the most recent updates around this case that I was able to find said that WorkSafe is charging 13 parties, 10 organizations, and three people. Nine of the groups are charged with failing to ensure the health and safety of workers and others, while the other is charged with failing to control a workplace. Each of these charges carries a maximum fine of more than $1 million. The three individuals face smaller fines charged under a provision that requires people with significant influence over a company to exercise due diligence in meeting health and safety obligations. The parties were only very recently named too. According to New Zealand Herald, they are White Island Tours, Wakare Management and its directors, James, Peter and Andrew Buttle, Kahu New Zealand and National Emergency Management Agency, GNS Science, Volcanic Air Safaris and Arius Limited. There's been some pushback from the defendants as far as which court this should be filed under, but otherwise this case is still very much in its early stages. There may be more released, but for right now, this is what we've got. The island has been closed since the incident, of course, and while I wished it had been closed sooner during that eruptive period, I think that Nagawi Ata has been compassionate and heartfelt during these times. One statement released about a month after the incident read, We continue to grieve with those who lost loved ones. Although there is little that can soothe such unfathomable pain, it is with heartfelt aroha and compassion we offer you our shelter, our tears, and our embrace. Our thoughts also remain with those who were injured so terribly in the eruption and pray that their wounds, both physical and emotional, will heal swiftly and completely in the hope that they will eventually return to the lives they enjoyed before the tragedy. They've taken a massive hit with this closure and the lack of summer tourism in 2020, aside from the pandemic, they continue to state that helping the community heal needs to be their biggest priority. Recent articles state that they are still thinking about the people, those who have passed and those who are still living with the event. That is after all, what's most important here. While I'm curious to see how this case goes and what else may be unveiled, ultimately no amount of money can bring back the lives lost. Nothing can change that, and my heart breaks for these families that have lost loved ones far too soon, and those living with the scars of that event today, emotionally and physically. And so, with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Weird Wild World. A solemn and stark reminder that we may enjoy nature in all its awe and glory, but we do not and will not be able to control such a beast. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.